So last week we covered up to 13.4 and I did like a small demo, silly demo of S3. I don't like how you did that. Uh, for this week, we have three sections left. Um, this first one is about object styles. And then the book said that we did a lot of um, vector style, which are like the dates or factors. And he said that in this uh, object types, the length, when you do length of that object, that's the number of elements you have for that particular object. But then uh, you have things like record, which um, they are lists of vectors of the same size. So almost like a data frame. Well, well data frame is a, another type. Um, but then the length here will be, um, I think the length, it won't be the number of objects, but the number of elements for the objects. So he has the example of uh, a, a timestamp. So here we have um, a vector, one, three, one, two, three. And so that creates three objects which internally each of these objects is a list of 11 elements. So there's an element for the year, for the month, the day, hour, minutes, uh, seconds and time zone. And so that's the record. So it's a list of vectors of the same length. Then in the list, uh, you'll see, for example, year. But then the year will be of a vector of length three with 2020, 2020, 2020. And so the only thing that will be different is the uh, seconds, which will be through one, two, three. Then there's the data frame, which is a two-dimensional record, but I mean, a record, it's, you can see as a two-dimensional thing, because then it's a list of vectors inside. So the only thing is that the length in that will give you how many uh, elements or yeah, observations you have. And then there's the scalar type, which is uh, one list that represents the whole object. So I don't know, like it's, that kind of reminds me of the record, but then this one is just the one thing. So a list represents uh, the, the object itself. Like, so for example, the linear model, there are on say, on say 11 elements, sorry, uh, um, that represent that particular uh, object, which is the linear model. So a bit blurry there. Uh, I'll just skip the exercise. And then we get to inheritance. Um, last week, I show you a small example of inheritance or what I call inheritance, which um, we had an animal object and then we had a fish. So the fish will inherit the animal properties. And so that's basically my understanding. But then with S3, um, the formal definition, it's so there is no formal definition. So you can basically say um, my object and then a vector with classes. And so that you can say that that's inheritance. It might not be because then uh, there are a few things that must be satisfied. That I think I have that. In, yeah, I will have that in a few slides. But then basically uh, you have a subclass and then a superclass and a subclass inherits for the, from the superclass. But then a subclass must be, um, the elements in the subclass must be uh, uh, a set from the superclass. Hopefully that makes sense. So you can't have something, or you can have some things in the subclass that, are, that must be in the superclass, but not the other way around. Um, let's see. Uh, well, there is this thing called the next method, uh, and we saw last week, which basically what it does is you have a vector of strings with your classes, 
so subclass, class, or whatever. And then if you call the next method, what you're saying is don't call the generic method for the subclass, but then call it for the next one. So imagine you have a vector for strings. So you have classes A and B. And so instead of calling, uh, for example, print for the class A, if you do next method, it will call print for class B. And so this is um, very useful when you're doing inheritance because then you might want to call the, the generic method for the super class. Uh, and then you can see that with uh, this loop S3 dispatch. Um, so the one with the equals arrow, that's the one that's gonna be called. But then uh, if you were to do next method, that will call the internal. So the one with the single dash, well, there's no dash is just an equal sign. But that's just for you to kind of see um, if it wasn't to call the factor, what what it will call, it will call an internal thing. Um, what I was, I keep saying about the subclass and superclass is this. Uh, imagine, um, I think I have an example in the next one. Yeah. So uh, he says that you should have like the classes should be ordered, and I used to do it the other way around. So for example, if you have a table and then you want to create your own class that inherits from table. Ideally, you should have your class and then the classes from a table. So, which is DBL, uh, DB and data frame, I think. So I give you here an example. You have a, a super class student and a subclass TA. So, a TA is a teacher assistant, which is a student as well, but then it has some more things like your salary. But then you should prefer to use this like subclass and superclass instead of the other way around, which will be the superclass and then subclass. Because I think uh, if I have, for example, two print statements, um, if I call if I have them this way, it will call first the print student instead of print TA. So I haven't I haven't tested that actually. Well, that might be something you want to be careful with, particularly with uh, generics that are the other class has implemented, like print that most of them have have implement an implementation of it. Um, there was a an example of the next method in the book uh, with a secret class. So he just created this new secret and it's just a double value. But then in the print, um, in instead of showing the actual uh, values, then it just shows an X based on how, how many characters that number has. So if you do, New secrets 15, 1, 456. It will show XX because it has two characters, then X because it has one and three. But then um, the next method comes here because then when you try to subset that, that vector we created here with three elements, uh, we are calling this the bracket. Gener generic. So the bracket generic, E relies on an internal thing. And so when you do uh, X uh, and then subset one, all the elements, it, it will show the actual value instead of hiding it as we wanted to, uh, as we wanted here. So the solution was to, you have to implement that generic. So the bracket that group class, and you have to use the back ticks because uh, thing otherwise I won't like it. And then internally, um, well, he said that there was a, an efficient solution, which was that you will remove the class of the object and then create a new secret. So, but then uh, you can rely on that 
on this next method by saying, okay, uh, this object has a, a secret class, but I want to call the secret print, for example, instead of the uh, internal that it's been already implemented with the bracket uh, generic. So after creating this generic method, then uh, subsetting, it will give the results we are expecting. Hope that makes sense. Uh, and then he had another example, which it was a super secret, super, super secret, I think. Which I have a question. Hmm? I have a question. What if, like with next method, like this is a really simple example that just has the secret class. And so it's going from like whatever the default for subset is like integer or something. And then it goes to the secret one that was written. But what if there are like four classes, you know, mm. like with example with a tibble, like uh, tibble and data frame and TVL and whatnot, like, what would next method, would next method go, what, where would next method go? And how do you make so, it go to the right one? So it's, it is my understanding that it will go in order. So uh, let me just to quickly check uh, where are the classes of the table. <laughs> I think it's the PBL, mm. one second. So I will, uh, so it's TBL underscore DF, then TBL and then data frame. So it's a a vector, those three characters, those three strings, sorry. And so if you have your own uh, class that inherits from Tibble, so then you'll have, I don't know, Steven, then TBL underscore DF, TBL and then data frame. So my understanding is if you do, for example, print that Steven or whatever your class is, and then you do next method, that will call the class, the, the stream immediately. So the next one will be TVL underscore DF. So that next method will call print dot TVL underscore DF. But I think, uh, I don't know if that's implemented or, because I was looking at some packages on GitHub and what they did is for that, like they have uh, two subclasses for one, one object. And what they did is that, for example, that TBL underscore T, D, uh, DF will call next uh, method internally. So it will say next, but then that one you just call with next internally calls next again. So it passes it, does that make sense? So they kind of, I guess they just like stack up, like assign yeah. a function with next method to every single, like to three different yeah. function names with each class. Yeah. Until, so it just passes it all the way down the stack. Yeah, until you reach which the one you want to actually use, for example. Oh, okay. Interesting. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Well, at least that's what I understand. So let's say 50-50, that might be right. I'll test it out. Okay. Uh, then there was uh, subclassing. So this is if you are creating a class, and so this is the constructor, but then you are going to allow for people to create subclasses of your, of your class. So in the book said that you must, in that case, you must have uh, the dot, dot, dot and a, a parameter called class as a string. If you want to enable that, so let's say you're developing a package and you want users to create their own subclasses with your class and you want, you want to do it the right way, course because then that's the whole thing i mean you can do it the wrong way and just do uh, class attach the classes and then put your own class uh, but if you want to do it the right way then you need to do the dot 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 and then uh, a parameter called class and what that will do is that internally 
it will pass those that 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 to the super class. Well, not to the super class. It will just create a new uh, structure object. Uh, and then, but then here you see, uh, it says the class, which is a subclass, it goes first, and then it goes to the parent class. So I think that might validate what I said that you want to have your subclass and then the superclass. So when you implement your generics, it gets called the generic you implemented. If it's, if it doesn't exist, then it will fall back to what you inherit inherited. So hopefully that makes sense. All right. Um and then we have 13.7. In the book says, you can ask if you want. I don't know if you skipped that. I was very tempted. But then I said, let's let's give it a try and maybe just uh, talk about it if anyone has any ideas. Um, OK, so the first one was, what happens when you call an S3 generic with a base object? So an object that doesn't have class, for example. So one, for example, if you have like a matrix, uh, one to five. And so before reading this, I just will imagine that I will uh, call like a, for example, print that matrix. And, but then when I, oh, I didn't run this, <laughs> damn it. So what happens is that internally, uh, there, there's no such thing like print that matrix. It falls back to the numeric, which it will be uh, the type of this element. So it does, what, what the book says is that it's not trivial the way it dispatches it. It's not just the class, but then it also looks at the types of the data itself. So it says, uh, there was a same book saying that the class does not uniquely identify an object. There are other things that are will look. And so that that was a little confusing to me because then I thought that if you have an object with a class, then that class will identify uniquely your your object. So if you had that class then I will call uh, the generics for that particular class. But then the book said something different, or maybe I didn't understand that. I don't know if you have any ideas. But it was something about that the class doesn't do something uniquely. So there was something with the types of the data. And so, yeah, I don't know. Wait, was that the like implicit versus explicit? class i think so yeah 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 so if you like don't imp explicitly assign the class it has a different dispatch at least that was yeah. the example yeah i don't know let's say next method and move on <laughs> um this one was an interesting one actually uh, the group generics, because um, I was looking for an interesting example to show. And I came with someone who implemented an errors class. So you can handle uncertainties when you do measurements. So a number plus minus some uncertainty. And then they were saying, uh, well, now we have implemented the print, we have implemented uh, C, like a generic for C, a generic for the bracket, square bracket. But then the person said, you might want to think that now you have to implement each um, like operation, like plus, minus, and all of those. And that's a lot of work. <laughs> or imagine you forget one of them by chance, and then you release that, and you used to say, oh, this thing can add two objects, which I'm expecting to do. But then uh, R comes to help you, and there are these group generics, which my understanding is that when you do, for example, math that your class that implements all the generic methods for 
all these functions. And I think there are more. So for example, if you do math that my class and you do you do it properly, like proper implementation, then you can later on call uh, absolute value of that object, if that makes sense, uh, then square root of that just by implementing the math that class, math that your class. So basically it saves you a lot of, a lot of work like by implementing each of them. And if you do ops that your class, then same, you can do uh, all the, these operations. And so I think it's very handy because imagine how much time will save you uh, by just doing like ops that your class and instead of just doing plus that class minus that class. And so I think that's pretty handy. I don't have an example for that because that's not the kind of thing I do. Um, I don't know if any of you does the kind of thing, like implement your own. An usage will be maybe you can, you want to implement your own data type kind of thing. Like, I don't know what that would look like, but maybe you are doing some research and you need if some data type that our base R does not have. So that might be a case. And then finally, there's the double dispatch. And if, if dispatch is not very clear, now imagine what this double dispatch do. Um, well, the thing is that the example they gave you is you have two, two objects uh, here, for example, object with class A, object with class B, and you want to add them up. Um, the, those two objects, like uh, the opposite, it should be the same, like the result, class B plus the class A, ideally. So for that to work, uh, you have to double dispatch, which means that R will look at the class of both objects. And based on those two classes, then it will dispatch the core, it will call basically the corresponding uh, generic method. So, because then uh, they give you an example that they have a date object and then an integer. And so if you, if for example, this was uh, to dispatch only by the class in A, then date plus integer will be different that a integer plus the date. So that's the whole reason that you need to double dispatch to look at both objects and then call the right uh, generic method. Uh, it says that there were three possible outcomes that the methods are the same. So they have the same uh, up class. Uh, methods are different and R falls back to the internal method with a warning. So I will tell you something like, I don't know, you're trying to add a date in a string? No, maybe not. Mm. A date or a string and a double, for example. I think that's not implemented in R, maybe Python. Um, or the one method is internal and which R calls the other method. So one is internal, the R is not internal, then R calls the, the one that's not internal. Uh, the methods are different. So date and double, for example, then R falls back to internal method. And then there's one that is internal and another one that it's not. So that was it. It was a bit confusing to me and some of this stuff I have not implemented my own, so I think that's it. Um, sorry for the vague explanation, but this part was a bit weird for me and like new. So I guess now we can talk about the chapter. Like if you have any interesting ideas of S3 now that we are all experts. I was very confused by that secret example. And I still don't really know. I guess we didn't talk about this like VEC restore. Um, no. 
I saw that and I was like, mm -mm, stay away from this. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, that was to like make sure it gave the right class back? I don't even remember. Yeah, I didn't get that because so what what does that mean? Why don't why don't you just use like next method if you want to get the right class or I, I didn't get that to be honest. Um I think with the uh, secret, is it you're confused with the with this with the bracket with the bracket uh generic, is it? Yeah. Like, why did you do use next? but then you call that with a new, a constructor. Well, I think when you were talking about it, I think I got it. But then there's like more to the example for this like super secret thing. Yeah. That was confusing. Because uh, I guess you had to call the, well, so the, I think the next method, what, just indexes and then the new secret implies the printing of the right thing. Yeah. So that makes sense, but yeah, not very clear, I guess, which we've all kind of <laughs> yeah. I, mentioned I just... throughout the book about the examples being <laughs> a little weird. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I did, I ignored that uh, vectors back restore because I was like, what is this supposed to do? <laughs> I think I also skipped a section somehow. That object yeah. style. <laughs> hmm. So I have a question I still don't understand yeah. this after doing this chapter um, so like mutate uses use method and it has um, I guess default ones for tibbles and data frames and whatnot and if you use method on like a class or at least the class that I construct, because I probably did it wrong, um, it strips out any extra attributes that are unique to that class. Um, and yet, like when I, when I use it on something like Civil, which is a time series Tibble, um, it will mutate it and it retains the it retains the classes and the attributes and the extra attributes, whereas the way I constructed it, it does not. Does anybody have any experience with like how to get, how to create a class appropriately such that it does not strip um, the attributes without writing an actual like S3 dispatch method? Because I looked in Civil and they didn't write an SP, uh, an, a dispatch method for mutate. They didn't like make another mutate class to specifically handle Tibble TS. It just uses like, it just uses mutate as is, but somehow they were able to retain the attributes um, when, when you mutate. I think that super secret example was, I don't know. That's the extent of my experience in this chapter in this book. <laughs> but I guess you're saying you don't like see, because it looks like they still had to write a generic for the, I guess. They didn't. Sure. Uh, in, in oh, the they just put it in, in the, they put the VEC restore in the secret generic. Hmm. But I guess it's not like a vector, so. Maybe that's what it is. But the thing is that's, that's creating an actual um, dispatch method. Like I could make a dispatch method 
that's like mutate dot symbol, this other thing that it just basically adds a character attribute, um, a named character attribute, and that would fix it. But the thing is, is like, that's not how they handle it in the actual civil package because civils just work. You can mutate them. They retain all their attributes, but there are no dispatch methods for mutate or any of the other things like that in the actual civil package. So like, something they somehow have it automatically inheriting um, the dispatch methods from mutate while retaining all the special attributes of its civil. And I do not understand how they did that. I guess that might be something uh, related with inheritance. So yeah, for sure. Civil inherits from Tibble, I, I guess, right? Yeah. And so I will assume that if you don't implement your generic method for your class, then that will fall back to the super class, which in this case will be for a Cibo will be a Tibble, which I will say somewhere internally, uh, there's, well, there's, there must be that mistake for a um, Tibble. And then I guess maybe they implement have like the a dot, dot, dot. What does that mean? Hmm? I see in on their GitHub page, they wrote a bunch of generics. Really? For the civil one? What? T-S, civil? Yeah, civil. Here, I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, I, I'm on it now. You, you, there's generics in there? In the deep IR verbs that are. Deep IR verbs that are. Looks like they defined a bunch of stuff. I don't think uh, mutate, what? but. That's weird. So I guess like that stuff doesn't actually show up when you use the three dots. Like, cause I was looking, I was looking at Sybil and then I used the three colons to see like what internal mm. functions were in the package. Mm. And I guess that um, those methods don't show up or no, maybe mm. there's just not a method for mutate. You yeah, see I didn't one see a mutate? mutate one though. No, it's just transmutate though. Which yeah, are, so they I don't have they don't have mutate, but mutate retains all of the attributes. So I'm wondering what's happening there. Like how, how do they have it? How do they have that class set up that mutate does not strip attributes? Cause like you can construct a class with like structure, base it on Tibble, add the class to it, and then add some custom attribute, name it whatever mm -hmm. you want with structure and then as soon as you do mutate on it it will strip that and it will be gone hmm. and yet somehow they made tibble ts uh retain those attributes yeah. maybe i should ask in the advanced r like how is this done? How did they manage to do this? Yeah, that's a good question. Because I'm sure it must be somewhere. Well, the question is where? Um, let's see. Yeah, I'm trying to find like what file they define their constructors in. Like maybe I just didn't make the constructor right and that's why it's stripping the stuff. So they, they have a bunch of like vec cast and vec, like stuff from vectors, vectors, p type two. 
And I know mutate uses a lot of vectors internally. I don't know. Yeah, that's real puzzling. It's it's kind of driving me nuts because I'm like, I can make this class come out of the package, but as soon as it comes out of the package, if you do anything to it, it's gone. <laughs> mm. Mm. Well, I'm gonna ask on the advanced start or not on advanced start, but just on the Slack how to do that. Has anyone else worked with S3 classes or doing Not their own generic? Like a programmer, <laughs> only as the user. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been working on a new package for uh, uh, getting like uh, train data here in the UK. Train, so uh, they have a service that you you just send a request and it will return an XML file and then you just parse it. But then each XML, it has a class. And so in the website, they tell you oh, this class and you should expect the subject. So I tried to do like an S3 uh, generic for it, like to extract each of the XMLs. But then, um, Every time I, I try to parse the, the data, I keep losing the class because I, I don't have a constructor. So I just created a function called read class. So I force the class onto my, onto a list basically. So it's probably not a good approach, but it works. So I have a list with, uh, list with, uh, whatever the data is that I'm trying to parse. And then I just do a read class. And then I have a generic implemented that it knows how to read a particular list. So I think I've, I've been using it wrong and I still keep using it wrong after reading the chapter. So <laughs> don't be like me. <laughs> but then I guess that's the whole thing with S3 that it's not very formal. You can do whatever you want. And if it works, then great. <laughs> yeah. The problem is if you have a package or something and someone tries to use it and then it breaks, then people say this doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So next week, who's going? Our six. So, Stephen, the thing is done. Our six. Okay. Yeah. I guess, yeah, I think I'm going next week. Should be interesting. Uh, yeah. I've been doing a lot of stuff with environments lately. I didn't make an R6 class. I guess I probably could have. I've got like this function that's really, like really complex and deeply nested. And the problem w was like passing 
many, many arguments, like seven, eight arguments, all the way down through like layers and layers of sub functions was a pain when you just pass them through direct arguments. And so it took me a while, but I finally figured out to just like make an environment at the top level of the function, put all the user supplied arguments in there and then like pass those with a default argument all the way down into every single function. So every function is written with like this default argument that just grabs the environment from its parent environment. And so every function that has that argument will grab the environment all the way down to the very bottom. So every single one has all the variables it could possibly need. It took a long time to figure that out. So since it's the same environment, if you were to modify one of the variables uh, in the deep nested function, then that will be available to an outermost function, right? Yeah, exactly. Because yeah, because that's what I like of of R six of what I have read that if you you just modify your object and then uh, you can just link calls to functions, and so it remembers what you have done. And because then I think we saw that when we were trying to uh, when we discuss about the super assignment, super assignment operator, which is uh, double minus less than less than and dash, that we wanted to modify the parent environment. But each R6 object has its own environment which every member of it has access to. So, I don't know, I think it's gonna be an interesting chapter. <laughs> Cause I haven't used it much. Well, seems handy. Yeah. R6 seems really useful for like when you want an environment to ride around with a class of object which there's definitely different cases where that is is exceedingly useful. I, I mean, there's certain cases where like, that's the only possible way to solve certain problems. Yeah. Like any, any kind of streaming data is where it makes the most sense. I used it once because uh, I work someone had this Python code and they had a class. So they had a bunch of constants and, and I was like, how am I supposed to do this with uh, with R? Because then I had the list with all the constants and then I had to pass that list to every every single function. Because then in, in Python you do like self and that self is my environment basically. And I, I got to implement it, but then basically I had a a dummy parameter, which it was the environment. And so I was passing that around. I was like, oh, this is a pain idea. And then I figure out about R6 and then it works just so nicely. Cause then you can hide things from users. So, and you will we'll see that next week. <laughs> I don't want to spoil anyone, but then you can hide things in your environment. And, but then those are available to the functions inside that environment. So I love it. Kind yeah, I wonder, like, kind of one of the hesitations I had with implementing an R6 class to, like, carry the variables down, it's basically, like, this function calls an API, and the API kind of sucks, and it only returns a certain amount of data at one given time, so uh, if you have a large request, you don't get all the data that you request. And so it has to like, there's a like sub loop that looks at the data and finds gaps in the data and then loops over and pulls more data, you know, puts it into the same tibble and then loops again and again and again until there aren't any gaps left. And I was thinking about using R6 to kind of like create that environment, create the object, the tibble in there, and then have it modify that with each pass 
But then I thought when you get a tibble out, you subset a tibble with the uh, dollar sign and you also subset or like pull up the functions within an R6 class with the dollar sign. So how would that work? How would you be able to differentiate like columns from the sub methods of the R6 class? I guess you'd have, you'd have to make like the tibble a specific method of the R6 class. And that just seemed like weird. I think it would confuse people. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Because make there, there's no difference. You call them the same way. Uh, yeah. So huh. I had a similar issue with the, that same API to get the train data that it will only allow me to pull 10 records every time, like every request. And so I was like, mm, how can I <laughs> fix this? So I just did a like uh, a map. So I did a map and then uh, in their API, they had a time offset parameter. So mm. in the map, I just did offsets of 10 minutes. So every 10 minutes. And then I just did uh, row by, bind by rows. And then I did this thing. And so that fixed the, the issue because then it just did a bunch of requests. And then it got me like three hours worth of data instead of just the 10 minutes that they will allow you to. So that was, to be sneaky. First, that was the exact same way I, when I first built this, no, I didn't, first like it was somebody else's package. They let it break and orphaned it and I wanted to use it and it started breaking down. And so I picked it up and started doing it. And when I first came on this problem, that was the exact way I thought about doing it. I was like, okay, well, if I can like test this API and see how it delivers data in certain ways, then I can like pre, like pre-plan a functionalized request to like get all the data that I know should be there in like a functional programming way. And that was my first approach. And then I started to realize that like, A, they're changing the APIs to, they're changing the APIs a lot. They're like, it's a startup company. So they're, they're altering the APIs. And three, their contracts with the data delivery companies uh, change and like the, how much granularity they have for any particular point in time changes like the further it goes into the future, they only have like a certain granularity of data for like data that's very close to today. And then farther you go back, the data gets more spotty and it's like down to the nanosecond and the API will return like, it says a hundred thousand data points. And, but the nanosecond like level of data is really spotty. And so if you ask for like a year, how like 100,000 nanoseconds randomly distributed in the year, you have no idea where it's gonna end up giving you data till. It just like, it'll randomly give you data till October in one year, and then it'll randomly give you data till like November in another year because there's more like, uh, the data is more full in that other year. And so 100,000 fills up a lot faster. And so the way they like allocate data makes it completely unpredictable. So I had to like go back and revise the whole freaking package. Uh, but fortunately, Sybil um, made some nice functions called like find key apps that allow you like construct a regular interval Sybil and then like easily figure out what data should be expected in a regular time series. And so it just like loops over that again and again, finding the gaps and filling them and finding the gaps and filling them. And that was the only way I could figure out how to do it because it's like, this API is ridiculous. It returns totally random stuff every single time it returns. That sucks. Yeah. <laughs> I was like just complaining to the people for a long time on Slack because they have a Slack. And then I was just like, this is not going to get anywhere. Like there's, they're, they, they set it up. They like built it from the ground up like this. I'm just going to have to figure out a way around this.
So if you're building an API in the future, make it make it return things that are like predictable, <laughs> extremely predictable by a human being. <laughs> I know Plumber allows you to build APIs. I've messed around with it once, but I haven't like built out an actual API before. I wanted to try that. Oh, I don't know if I have time now, but that's definitely something I would like to try. Plumber? Yeah. Yeah. Because this thing, uh, it, I mean, it's good for an API because it's free. I mean, you just get a token. You give them your email again, you get a token to access the their data. Um, but then it's very old, so it's, it's not trivial to access the data because then you have to submit a request and then it has to, you need certain tags even if they're empty. So for normal users, it's not pretty straightforward. So I want to make that easier, but we'll see how it goes. It kind of only makes sense if you're trying to like, if you have like a team of other data scientists who want an API to be able to pull something from some kind of centralized place on your team. I think that's yeah. where it like would make the most sense or being yeah. able to like programmatically do something remotely. Has anybody ever worked with like, I mean, I know Shiny is like fairly mobile friendly and you can like interact from a mobile phone with an R instance via Shiny. But has anybody like looked into like how you could interact via like a mobile app with a R instance? Are there any like, has anybody built some package for that or something? Mm -hmm. No idea. Because I think it would be it would be nice if you could like have uh, like especially if you're running stuff for long periods of time, if you could get notifications about what your R instance is doing, like on your mobile phone, so you can walk away mm -hmm. from it and know what's going on. Yeah. I don't know about that, but I know you can have it, like, email you when it's done. Yeah. Yeah, I used our push bullet to just, like, send myself notifications through push bullet, but... Hmm. If anybody figures out about that mutate thing and how to preserve that, please do let me know. It's puzzling me. <laughs> okay. Good chat, guys. I'm going to go now. Yeah. Take care, everyone. <laughs> see you next week. Yeah. Bye. Thanks see for you presenting. Week. Bye, all. Yeah, thank you, Roberta. Yeah. Bye. Bye.